Well, good morning, Gateway. How are you all doing this morning? Come on, come on. You know, I love healing services because it's just a great opportunity to pray together and connect with one another. And also, we love hearing the stories of what God's doing. You know, during, during our prayer time there, I had someone approach me and just say that God healed their heart. That they had like a heart transplant and, you know, all the things that go along with that. And now there's no issues anymore. So, you know, God is good. God is amazing. And that's the beauty of, of God. That's the beauty of what he does and how he operates. Uh, and so I just encourage you, if you're here, um, you got prayer and something changed, like God did something in your life, whether it's this Sunday or previously in the past, or even outside of the church, we love to celebrate the stories of what God is doing in people's lives. Gateway.ac slash share. We have a form. We would love to hear your story. And, and if you'll let us to share your story even if it's anonymous. So just encourage you, if you have a story, check that out. Um, well, welcome, though, to week two of our series, or week three, actually, of our series. I'm already losing track of time. The last week was minus 40. Three quarters of you weren't here, so that week doesn't count, right? Um, but week three of our series that we're calling The Unveiled Kingdom. You know, I love this series and, uh, because this series is really focused on the message of Jesus and, and specifically it's focused on the word that God gave us for a church this year, which is that we would be the kingdom of God. You see, as a church in, in November, we invited everyone to come out and, and to prayerfully seek God's will for his church. Because as a church, we think it's important that we not do things the way we want, but that we do things the way God wants. And so we gathered a group of people and we prayerfully sought God and we asked God, what is your will for your church this year? And he told us that he is calling us as a church. That's not just an organization. We are the church. The church is the people. That God is calling this church to become the kingdom of God. Which is a statement that means that instead of, you know, coming to church on a Sunday, doing our whole Christian thing, and then going home and that's it. That we would become active participants in changing the world with the love and power of God. Because God's kingdom is powerful. God's kingdom is important. God's kingdom changes situations. And God has given us access to his power and his love to change the world around us. Christianity, following Jesus, isn't about just going to heaven when you die. It's about bringing heaven to earth while you're alive. And so we've been talking. Last week we talked about this. I know a lot of you missed this message. It's okay. But how God's plan throughout all of history has always been to build his kingdom through his people. Started in the garden with humanity created in God's image as his representatives, priests and kings on the earth. Expanded through Abraham and his family and then Israel, who is a kingdom of priests, subjected to God as their king and serving God. And now it's expanded to the church. Because the message of Jesus is not just a message of believe in Jesus and you'll be saved and go to heaven when you die. That's part of it, but that's a redu reductionistic view of the kingdom. It's a reductionistic view of Jesus' message and his purpose. But rather, that the purpose and the calling of God is that we would bring his kingdom to earth here and now. Now, a few months back, I was reading this book. It's a fantastic book, uh, How God Became King by N.T. Wright. I'm going to quote this a few times today because N.T. Wright is one of the leading scholars in New Testament theology and understanding who God is. Um, heavy writer, but amazing, amazing things he says. But he says this in, in his book. Flip to the wrong bookmark there. He says this. He says, millions of readers... When they hear Matthew's Jesus talking about doing this or that so that you may enter the kingdom of heaven, we assume without giving it a moment's thought that this means so that you may go to heaven when you die. But that is not at all what Matthew or Jesus for that matter had in mind. 
Matthew makes it quite clear, and I think Jesus made it quite clear what the phrase means. Think of the Lord's Prayer, which comes at the center of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. The center of the prayer itself, we see Jesus teaching his followers to pray that God's kingdom might come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not about people going to heaven. It's about the rule of heaven coming to earth. So God sent his son to save us from our sins, not just so we could go to heaven, but so that we could bring heaven to earth. And when heaven sits, steps into a situation, things change. It's why we do healing prayer. Because Jesus healed the sick, so we be- believe God, the Hebrews, I think it's 12, says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Jesus healed, then he still heals. Jesus hasn't changed. And when God's kingdom steps into a situation where there is sickness, sickness leaves. Because in heaven, there is no disease. In heaven, there is no death. In heaven, there is no, no sin. Heaven is the complete rule of God. And so the calling that Jesus gives us is to be bearers of his kingdom. To bring his kingdom to earth. On earth as it is in heaven. See, in 2 Corinthians, or actually, first, first in Matthew... This is the message Jesus preaches all throughout Matthew. This is Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know, one of our challenges that we put to the church this this month was to read the entire book of Matthew in one sitting. How many people have done that so far? Two? (laughs) One of my staff just said two sittings. Come on. Audio, love it, love it. That's amazing. How many of you who read Matthew in one sitting noticed the theme of kingdom? Yeah? Come on. Starts here, 417. Began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Verse 23, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness from among the people. Because God's kingdom is a powerful kingdom. And Jesus taught the kingdom, but he also demonstrated the kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What's all the things? Well, he's talking about don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll wear, because I'll take care of you. Instead, seek the kingdom first. Matthew 9, 35. Jesus, it says, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. Because the kingdom is a powerful kingdom. Now, I could spend this entire message just going verse by verse by verse by verse in Matthew. That's what we'll do for the rest of the series starting next week. But this is just a synopsis of what Matthew says over and over and over again. I could quote Matthew 13, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, Matthew 20 20 and, and 25, like all of these verses that lead to the cross and when Jesus is crowned as king on the cross and then he comes back, he's raised from the dead and he says, all authority in heaven and earth belongs to me. He says, go therefore. See, God instituted his kingdom through Jesus, but then he gave us the ministry of expanding his kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5 puts it this way. It says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. I love this verse. It's saying who you were is gone. When you believe in Jesus, who you were, that person is now dead because it has been forgiven. All of your sins have been covered. There's nothing left that remains of them. You might still have those tendencies, but it's all been dealt with. In God's eyes, you are new. But he says this. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. 
Now, I love this passage for so many reasons. But notice, it says, through Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, in the ancient world, like in the context, the culture to which this was written, reconciliation, it was, it still is, the act of restoring a relationship that was broken. But in that day and age, the expectation was the person who wronged the other person had to initiate the reconciliation. Like if I said something that offended my wife, if, okay. Um, (laughs) When I say something that offends my wife, let's be real. It's a real church. Um, The idea of reconciliation is that I would go and say, I'm sorry, and we would restore the relationship. For God, the party who was wronged to initiate the reconciliation, that was scandalous in their culture. But that's what, Jesus, or what Paul says God did. He reconciled us to himself. While we still hated him, he came and died for us so that our relationship might be restored. But then what does he, what does he do? He gives us the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of Christ. We preach his kingdom. We bring his kingdom into the world around us because God reconciled us to himself. See, the point of everything I'm saying right now is that the message of Christ is more than just going to heaven when you die. The message and ministry of Christ is equipping us to expand his kingdom on the earth. And the gospel message, and really what I want to look at this morning, is the reality that through Jesus, God has become king. The king has come, and he is reigning, and is giving us that ministry. So I want to look specifically at Jesus, this reality that the king is, has come. You know, we talked last week about the, the plan of God throughout creation to, uh, to, to establish his kingdom on the earth through us. We talked about how it started with humanity at the start in the garden and expanded to, to the nation of Israel who are suppo- supposed to represent God to the world. And then Israel's like, God, We know you're our king. We don't want you to be our king. We want our own king. Give us your power, but we don't want to do what you say. Um, And essentially, the nation of Israel, who's supposed to represent God, abandons God. And to just give a really brief synopsis of thousands of years of history, after all of this time where they keep rejecting God and abandoning God, there's a point where God withdraws his protection from them, and the nation of Israel is conquered by the Babylonian Empire. And basically, in that time, before the, the, they were conquered, Israel believed they were the kingdom of God. They thought the kingdom of God is a geopolitical reality based on our nation. And when they go into captivity, well, the kingdom of God must, must have died. That's the perspective. Again, really brief synopsis of thousands of years of history. If you want a more in-depth look at it, last week talked about it extensively. It's, that's a really foundational message for this series. But what's fascinating is during this period as, that's known as the exile, where Israel has ceased to exist, exist as a nation. They're a culture, they're a people, but they're not their own nation. It is during this period that God begins to speak through the prophets and declare, I am going to send a greater king who will establish my kingdom forever. Isaiah 42 to 55, I'm not going to read the whole thing because we don't have time. But it's this beautiful passage that starts with, your God reigns. That's Isaiah 42, I believe, verse 7 which scholars say is a declaration of your God has become king. And the story through those passages, through those chapters, it goes on to describe the works of Jesus, instituted the, instituting the kingdom of God on earth through his suffering and death. Before Isaiah 55, the kingdom manifests fully 
and the earth is restored to God's original design. We see passages like Isaiah 9, which declares that there's a a baby who will be born. He will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, and the governance of the world will rest on his shoulders. Micah 5 talks about out of Bethlehem, the least of the the families of Judah will come a great king who will save his people. We see all of these passages talking about Jesus coming as the great king who will restore. But where I want to focus today is in the book of Daniel. See, Daniel is this, it's one of the major prophets, one of the, the major prophetic figures in the Old Testament. And he lived during this period of the exile, where they, Israel is in captivity at the start to Babylon. At the end, it's to Persia because Babylon collapses and Persia takes over. And this book is racked. It's filled with this prophetic insight of what God is going to do. Now, I do want to give some context. See, Daniel is what we consider to be prophetic apocalyptic literature, which is to say that it is a God revealing through Daniel, this is what I'm going to do in the future. Now, very important note, because we get this wrong all the time when reading apocalyptic literature, like Daniel, um, like the end of Daniel from Daniel 7 on, or, or Revelation. We read it as what God will do in our future. Just going to clarify, when God spoke to Daniel, he is speaking about what's going to happen in the future from that moment he spoke. A lot of the things that we immediately look at and say, oh, well, Daniel 7 talks about four beasts, so that must be these nations. Those things are us reading into Scripture. Scripture can never mean what it never meant. We have to understand the context. But Daniel, he's telling this story of specifically what's going to happen in the next couple hundred years in the geopolitical sphere of where Israel resides. And he says this, Daniel 7. Basically, he has, he has this vision, um, and he sees these four beasts appearing, and all of this craziness, and it says, verse 4, The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Now we know from the context, sometimes people are like, well, that beast must have been like Nazi Germany or whatnot. We know from the context of Daniel that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is the one with the eagle's wings. That's how Jeremiah describes him in the book of Jeremiah. We know from Daniel 4 that his power is stripped from him. He gets so prideful, God comes to him and says, you will lose everything and be humbled. He becomes like a human being, loses his mind for, I think it's like seven years before God restores him. From Daniel 2, we know this first beast is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And then he goes on, another beast appeared, the second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. This beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. Again, prophetic apocalyptic literature is about what's happening in the future from when it's written. Some of that might be still in our future, But specifically from the context of Daniel, we know it's in his future. And another important thing to note with it is it is filled with symbolism, figurative language. Like at no point would Daniel have understood that there's literally going to be a beast with four wings and and three tusks and ten heads. That's all figurative, symbolistic language. It's hyperbole. But Daniel, he sees this vision of these four beasts. But then the vision, it shifts. And suddenly, he's brought before the throne of God, and he sees God sitting on the throne of judgment, judging these beasts. It says, verse 13, 
As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one, that's God, and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So Daniel, he sees these, this vision of these four beasts. He's like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And then he sees God, this declaration, God is greater. And specifically, this declaration that one like the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven. Now, in the ancient culture to whom this was written, they would have understood this phrasing in three ways. The first was they would have understood it in terms of representation. That God was going to send one who would represent Israel, who would stand in for Israel. We see this as well in Isaiah when he talks about the suffering servant, that Israel is the suffering servant, but on a greater level, Jesus is the one who embodies Israel and represents them, stands in their place. Second, they would have understood it in terms of vindication, that God is the one who who, who, who would disperse judgment against the nations who had oppressed them. Now, God says elsewhere in the Bible, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God is the great judge. And they would have seen in this illustration of the Son of Man coming, judgment against the people who have rejected God and hurt God's people. But third and most importantly, they would have understood this in terms of kingdom. That there's one who is coming who would usher in God's kingdom for God's people. Now to quote N.T. Wright again, and I'm going to quote him a few more times in this message as well, because, you know, one of our values is we want to make sure everything we say from the stage is accurate biblically and is supported also by people who are way smarter than we are. I just have a bachelor's degree. This guy probably has like five PhDs. I don't know. But expert in like the, the Greek language, I know one word in Greek. Theos. It means God. Come on. (laughs) But N.T. Wright, he writes it this way. He says, and this is specifically, he's talking about Daniel 7. He says, this is not, in other words, simply about the rescue or salvation of God's people from the present plight. It's about their being rescued in order to be enthroned. There is no doubt that the gospel writers are telling the story of Jesus in such a way as to evoke Daniel 7. See, the message of the gospel is evoking this imagery that God is, has come. He is judging the nations. He has judged the nations, and he has sent one like the Son of Man, that's a title Jesus takes for himself, to rule over the world. But then Daniel 7, it goes on. And Daniel, he has this amazing revelation. God's shown him this amazing thing, but he's confused. And so he goes and he asks an angel for interpretation. See, if you've taken my, my class on hearing God's voice, or if you're, um, if you've, if you're joining my group on, on how to read the Bible um, that's starting up pretty soon, uh, you'll know, you'll hear me talk about this idea of three aspects to hearing and understanding God's voice and Scripture. There's three parts. Revelation, interpretation, and application. Revelation, what God says. That might be the Bible or what he speaks to you. Interpretation, what it means. Because sometimes, like in Daniel 7, it doesn't make sense. And the third is application, how it applies to my life. And so Daniel, he goes and he asks the angel, what does this mean? And the angel says to them, as for these four great beasts... Four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Four great beasts are four kings. Now in the Hebrew language, or actually in the Aramaic, which Daniel 7 was written, 
the word translated as kings can be translated either as kings or kingdoms. There's the same word. So the idea is that there's four great kings or kingdoms that will arise, but then the kingdom of God will come. So we know from this passage, we know the end date. Because the, it ends, four great beasts, it ends with Jesus being enthroned. When was Jesus enthroned? On the cross. If Jesus was not enthroned on the cross, then he couldn't stand before his disciples in Matthew 28 and say, all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. Jesus is king over the world through his death on the cross. So there's our end date. Now, if you're like me, I, I, when I read this passage, I was like, okay, what are the beasts? Who are the beasts? Now again, it's pretty easy for us to try and be like, oh, well, it's these four countries. Now, it's ironic. Um, whenever Christians tend to read apocalyptic literature, we tend to think of whoever is being described in a negative light, like four beasts or Revelation, there's Gog and Magog. We always apply it to the greatest enemy of the United States of America. I just think it's ironic. In the 80s and 90s, it was Russia. When I, ste I, I stepped out of that circle for a long time, and then I met a guy, I think was, this was like five years ago, and he was telling me how Gog and Magog was China. I'm like, that's ironic. So it was Russia, then it was Iran, then it was North Korea, now it's China. It's whoever's the greatest enemy of the United States of America. Let me tell you, the United States does not embody the kingdom of God. Great nation. God is doing amazing things in that country. But God is also doing amazing things in Russia and in China and in North Korea and in Iran, God is moving everywhere. His kingdom is not bound by one government. But it's easy. It's like four beasts. Okay. Well, in the context, they follow one another. So maybe it's Nazi Germany and then the USSR and then Russia and now, now it's China. But to read that that way is to do a disservice to the scripture. The Bible can never mean what it never meant. We cannot read our ideas into Scripture because if the original author and the original audience would never have understood it the way we understand it, we're wrong. God's authority is bound to the original meaning. God spoke to these original authors in their context, a timeless message that applies to us, but to understand it, we have to understand the context. So in the context... Who are the four beasts? I went down a rabbit hole on this one, guys. We spent way too much time researching and trying to understand this. Now we know from Daniel 2, the first beast is Nebuchadnezzar. It's the kingdom, the empire of Babylon, the Babylonian empire. From there, scholars differ. Some say the second empire, second beast is the Mede empire. Third is the Persian Empire. Fourth is the Macedonian Empire. Some say second is the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Macedonian Empire, then the Roman Empire. And I learned one very important thing about this. It doesn't matter. What is the point? The point is, it doesn't matter what happens. Jesus is king. Daniel 7, verse 26, it describes before this everything that the fourth, fourth beast will do and the havoc it will wreak on the earth or reap on the earth. It says, then the court, the court of God shall sit in judgment and his dominion, the dominion of the fourth, fourth beast shall be taken away to be consumed and totally destroyed. I love that. Fourth beast, the most powerful of the beasts. God's like, yeah, he's powerless. I can, I'm just going to take it all away. The kingship and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Specifically, we know this is talking about Jesus coming. And we know, even, even more clear, Jesus uses the scripture to support his role. Matthew 26, 
it says that Jesus, after he was arrested, he was dragged off to the house of the high priest, Caiaphas. And to, there's this gathering, this illegal trial by night, where the religious elite of the day are trying to find a reason they can sentence Jesus to death. They bring all kinds of false witnesses forward. Nothing's sticking. Nothing's happening. And it says, uh, verse, I think this is verse 63, Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Basically, what's happening in this, Jesus is evoking the imagery from Daniel 7, 17, the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And in the eyes of the religious elite, Jesus is a backwater country speaker who's a troublemaker. Like, what reason do, you, do we have to believe in you? And why should we believe in you? And Jesus says, yeah, 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 you guys know Daniel 7, right? You know how you believe that there's this king who's going to come and reestablish the kingdom of God on earth? You think it's geopolitical. It's not. But I am that man. Jesus is that man. And then they're like, oh my goodness. And they beat him and hit him in the head and cover his head with a bag and say, prophesy, who punched you in the face? And stupid things like that. But they go and they kill him. But Jesus declares before the religious elite, yeah, you know the guy that you are waiting for to restore the kingdom of God. I am that man. I am the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and all authority and all power is being given to me. This is why Matthew 28, Jesus tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's why Paul in Ephesians 1 says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. It's this reality. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has become king. Philippians 2, Paul puts it this way. He says, Therefore, God exalted him even more highly, He's exalting Jesus because of Jesus' willingness to sacrifice himself. God exalted him all the more highly, gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth is in Jesus' hands. He has all power. He is above every kingdom. He is above every nation. He sits above and every knee will bend to him. Why? Because he's king. Jesus is king. The king has come and his name is Jesus. But the beauty, what I really love is that Jesus' ministry is not just about what he can do. It's about what he can do through us. Now to quote N.T. Wright one final time. If I can flip to it in my notes here. There we go. He writes this. He says, when we find the Greek phrase, zoe anamos, I don't know if I'm saying that right. But when we see that phrase in the Gospels and indeed in the New Testament letters, when it is regularly translated as eternal life or everlasting life, people have naturally assumed that this concept of eternity is the right way to understand it. But it isn't. In the many places where the phrase appears in the Gospels, and in Paul's letters for that matter, it refers to one aspect of ancient Jewish belief about how time was divided up. In this viewpoint, there were two aeons or ages, the present age and the age to come. The age to come, many Jews believed, would arrive one day to bring God's justice, peace, and healing to the world as it groaned and toiled within this present age. And then later on in the book, on the same topic, he says it this way. He says, new creation itself has begun. That's what the gospel writers are saying and will be completed. Jesus is ruling over that new creation. 
and making it happen through the witness of his church. Jesus is king. But as we've talked about previously, God is also a gentleman. and He will not force himself on to people. So Jesus has instituted the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom of God is simply everywhere that God is king. It's God's sovereign rule over all creation, both in heaven and on earth. But not everything is subject to him as king. Not everyone bends its knee to him as king yet. But the day is coming. This is what Jesus tells us, or not Jesus tells us, this is what the book of Revelation tells us, Revelation 20 to 22. The day is coming when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And everything, all sin, all death, all disease, all those things will perish. But in the meantime, Jesus has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Colossians 2.15 I'll read this verse and then we'll close. It says, He, being Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities, made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. So he's putting the death and resurrection of Jesus in terms of a conquering Roman emperor entering the, the city of Rome. He just won the victory. He's triumphed over his enemies. And there's a day that is coming when he will return to bring that rain fully to earth. But in the meantime, our mission is to be bearers of that kingdom. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, he has given us the message of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of God. We are God's representatives on earth. But how how can we represent God on earth unless we make God king first? Well, this is where I want to land today because the gospels are all about how Jesus became king. God is king. The king has come, but it has the king come in your life. Has Jesus been made king in your heart? in your mind, in your family, in your workplace, in your small business? Has the king been made, has Jesus been made king in your grandkids? And how you feel about a situation in your finances, in your, in your life? Is Jesus king of you? Because the kingdom of God is anywhere that God is king. And if we want to be bearers of God's kingdom, to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Then we have to be willing to surrender, to submit to his lordship over our hearts. So where I want us to end is just I want us to take a moment and ask God that question. And ask God, is there an area of my life that I have not made you king over? You know, we believe as a church that God wants to have a relationship with us and a big part of relationship with God is communication. We often call that prayer and we think of it as a one-way street, but God also wants to speak to us. John 10, uh, Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd and we are his sheep. It's this, this allegory of how we are in relation to Jesus, that he leads us, he guides us. But he says, my sheep hear my voice, which tells me we have the opportunity to hear the voice of God. There are many ways we can hear God's voice, some obvious, like an open vision or an audible voice, some less so, like image, an image God puts in our head or his voice into our mind. God can speak to us through others, through his word or directly to us. But God's voice is always loving. It will always glorify Jesus and it will always be in line with scripture because God is consistent. Who he is does not change. So I just want to encourage us just to take a moment. We're going to take about a minute and just ask God this question. If you want to close your eyes because you're distracted by things around you, that's, that's me. 
can. But just ask God this question and say, God, is there an, any area of my life where I have not made you king? We're just going to take a minute and let God speak. you he might have given something specific an area that you've been holding on to that he's asking you to surrender for some I know there's probably people in this room who you've never made that decision to make Jesus king over your life and if that's you honestly it's the best decision you can make and it's really easy you just have to say yes Whatever God said to you, maybe you need more time to pray into it at home, that's fine. But if God said something to you, I just want us to take 10 seconds and pray this prayer. And say, God, I repent of not letting you be king of my life. I repent of not letting you be king of whatever the area of it, your life is, my family, of my finances, of my work. And I renounce the lie, Lord, that I believed I don't need you in my life. I give you permission, God, to invade my life, to be king over every aspect of my life from this day forward. Amen. And honestly, I would encourage you, make this a part of your life. Let God into your life doesn't have to be complicated. All it needs to be is that you give him a say in your life. Some easy places to start are kingdom challenges for January. You know, memorize Matthew 5, 1 to 16. Read Matthew in one sitting. Take a one day, two day, three day, seven day fast from something you love, whether it's food or social media, and just seek God. But really at the core, it's all about saying yes. Yes, God, you can have access. No matter what you tell me to do, God, I will listen. I will obey. I will invite you in. Because the kingdom of God starts with our yes. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just invite you to invade our lives. I invite you to invade my life, God. Reveal to me any area that I have not made you king so that I can surrender it to you. Lord, I make you king over my life. I make you king over this church. Lord, we cry out for you. We need your kingship. Father, I thank you that even when we were lost and broken, that you sent your son to reconcile us to yourself. That even when people had rejected you, you sent your son and through Jesus, you established your kingdom on earth, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that cannot be defeated, a kingdom that is over everything in all of creation. And Lord, I thank you that you say, Daniel, that you have given that kingdom to your holy ones. We're your holy ones. We're the ones made holy by the death of Jesus. So Lord, I just pray that you will help us to make you king in our lives so that we can bring your kingdom, your power, your love into our spheres of influence. 
through our obedience and our submission to you as our king, that we will see our families, our friends, our workplaces, our city changed and transformed by your power and your love. God, we just say yes. Do what only you can do in us and through us. Pray this in your holy, holy name. Amen.